Hello, everyone. This is Ryan Scott, the pastor of the Refuge Church of Seattle. And on today's episode number one, we're going to be answering the question, how many gods are there? You're listening to the Bible Questions Answered podcast from the Refuge Church of Seattle. Find us online at refugeseattle.com. Welcome, everyone, to our very first episode of Answering Bible Questions, our very first episode of the Refuge Church of Seattle podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about how many gods there are. Are there one? Are there two? Are there many? Well, we're going to answer that question today, and we're excited because this is our very first episode for many more episodes in the future for the Refuge Church of Seattle podcast. And uh, what can you expect on this? Well, let me tell you a little bit about who we are, what we're doing, then we'll get into this Bible study talking about how many gods are there. First off, uh, we're a brand new church in the downtown Seattle area. We are currently holding services in the Belltown Community Center. And uh, that's on Sundays at 1 o'clock. Hopefully soon we'll be moving out of there and into a bigger facility to hold uh, us as we grow. And we are growing. We're very excited about what God is doing. We've only been having services now for about seven or eight months. And uh, God has been doing great things. So we're excited about the future of the Refuge Church of Seattle. And this podcast we are actually producing to start answering the questions that we get all the time about the Christian faith and about um, the Bible. There's a lot of things that people think are in the Bible. There's a lot of things that people have heard about what the Bible says, and it's important that we study the Bible for ourselves so that we know exactly what it says and we don't have to question it. We don't have to wonder, but we can actually find out what's in the Bible for ourselves. Jesus told us to make sure that we study the scriptures for in them we think we have eternal life. And that's an important, the way he worded that there, you think you have eternal life. Um, What he's saying is that if we take men's word for it and we just take what people say and we think that, oh, that's in the Bible or, you know, I'm saved because, you know, preacher so-and-so told me that I was saved, uh, that Jesus was saying, you you need to study the scripture because in them you think you have eternal life. But when you actually start reading the scripture, you might find out that what you believe is not in there and that uh, there's a completely different set of requirements for us to be saved in there. So um, it's important that we study the scripture, and that's what this podcast is about. We're going to be studying the things, the questions that we get um, from our audience, which you can send us questions to ask at refugeseattle.com, and we'll get to those as soon as we can on an episode by itself and try to answer those questions. Um, And we'll also put those into our video series on YouTube called the five-minute Bible study, where we will give a five-minute Bible study primer so that uh, you can go off and study these subjects and these questions on your own and find out what the Bible says. So um, you're asking me now, how many gods are there? Well, we'll get right into that discussion today. We don't want to waste your time. As a matter of fact, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we keep these podcasts as short and sweet as possible. And so we're going to dive right into the subject. How many gods are there? In the Old Testament, the Israelites were strictly monotheistic, meaning that they believed in one God, that there was only one God. And when you read the Old Testament, there's really no room for wondering how many gods there are. And we'll just name some of those scriptures here. You can go off and study them on your own later. But the first one that comes to mind is Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Of course, it's the most popular one. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. If you turn to Isaiah, there's a lot of scriptures about God in Isaiah, how many gods there are. Isaiah 43 and 11 says, I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Isaiah 44 and 8 says, Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. In Isaiah 44 and 24, it says, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, and spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. Isaiah 45 and 18 says, I am the Lord, and there is none else. And then in Zechariah uh, chapter 14 and verse 9, it says it like this, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. 
So it's pretty clear that in the Old Testament, they believed that God was one. And of course, at that time, uh, they were waiting for the Messiah. Jesus hadn't appeared yet, so there was no reason to believe in two gods, in the Father and the Son. They just believed in their Heavenly Father, which they called Jehovah. And they were strictly monotheistic, which means that they believed in one God. So what does that leave for us? And does that really answer the question? Well, yes, it does answer the question because it's in Scripture. And so at this point, we shouldn't really need any more information. We've already got all the information that we need because of we've read it in Scripture that there is one God. But still, there is room for confusion. And uh, if you are confused about how many gods there are because of some of the language in the New Testament of Jesus saying, you know, my Father and always talking about his Heavenly Father, you're in pretty good company because his own disciples were confused quite a bit about that. And we're going to talk about that, but uh, let's, let's move on into the New Testament. And, and one thing that we need to realize first when we're talking about oneness, especially when it comes oneness versus the Trinity, is uh, deciding on what the Trinity actually means. And uh, what the, tr- the doctrine of the Trinity means is that there are three distinct, co-eternal, co-equal persons in the Godhead. And it refers to each like this. You have God the Son, you have God the Father, and you have God the Holy Spirit. There are three gods. Now, some I have heard tried to argue and say that they don't believe in three gods. They believe in one God. But this one God is made up of three distinct co-eternal, co-equal persons, and each of them have their own consciousness. It's three people that make up one God. Uh, That really doesn't make sense to me because three people can't make up one God. You have, in essence, three gods making up a Godhead. That makes sense. But uh, you can't disguise the fact that you're now talking about three gods, no matter how much they get along, no matter how co-equal they are or how long they've been there. You still have the belief that there are three separate and distinct gods, which is fine if you believe that. I just don't think it it translates to Scripture. Colossians 2 and 8 says um, that in Jesus dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and that he is the head of of all principality and power. And so if you have three people making up a Godhead, all the fullness of that Godhead dwelt in Jesus bodily. So how can there be three uh, people in one person? And then um, it says that he is the head of all principality and power. And so you can't have three people that are co-equal If Jesus is the head of all principality and power, because he doesn't share power with anyone if he is the head. So it's pretty clear that there is one God and and that his name is Jesus. And also, it's also important to remember that the idea of the Trinity wasn't really introduced until around the fourth century, three to four hundred years after Jesus died. So are Jesus and God separate persons? Let's go into the New Testament and find out what uh, the disciples thought. Uh, Well, the disciples were confused, obviously. Um, They had been monotheistic. They were Israelites, and so they believed in Jehovah. They believed in Yahweh. They believed that hero Israel, the Lord our God, is one Lord. And then all of a sudden, this man comes along, and he's healing the blind, and he's healing the lame, and he's doing all of these miracles. He's turning water into wine. He is feeding 5,000 with just a little basket of food. And he's doing amazing things, and they're, they're following him, and they see the miracles. They see the things that he's doing and the things that he's teaching, and uh, they think that they are with the Son of God, and they are. Biologically, Jesus is the Son of God, and so they're following him around, but they really didn't understand who Jesus was, and it, it comes into play very clearly in John chapter 14. If you read the chapter of John chapter 14, it is a scene where the disciples are wondering who in the world is this. I I don't understand what he's trying to say when he's trying to describe to us who he is. And so in verse 7, you have Jesus talking to the disciples and he said, if you had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. And so he's talking to the disciples, and he just said that if you know me, you know my father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. He just revealed who he was to the disciples, and he was saying, you know me, you know the father. Uh, If you've seen me, you've seen the father. 
but it still confused the disciples because they were still thinking that Jesus was a separate person from the God they had always served throughout the history of the Old Testament. And so Philip says, hey, Jesus, in verse 8, he says, hey, Jesus, show us the Father. It'll be good for us if you show us the Father. And Jesus replies in John 14, chapter, uh, verse 9, and um, he's kind of amazed, and I don't think it shocked him because he knows the beginning from the end, but he acts amazed trying to um, make a point here. In verse 9, he says, really, in, in essence, he says, have we been together all this time and you don't know me? We've been together for years now, Philip, and you still don't know me? And he says, if you're looking at me, you're looking at the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How can I show you the Father? He asked him, how can I show you? If you're looking at me, you're looking at the Father. How can you say, show me the Father? Verse 9. He says, you're looking at him. Have I not been with you so long that you don't know who I am? If you're looking at me, you're looking at the Father. How can you ask then, show me the Father? I'm standing right in front of you. And so you're saying, well, hang on. Is is the Father the Son? That doesn't make sense. I've actually had people tell me, you know, it, it's ludicrous. It's kind of, you know, something inbred uh, terms with it that, that um, you know, Jesus is his own Father. That's exactly what it is. Uh, God manifested himself in flesh. God robed himself in flesh. Those are both biblical terms. Robed himself in flesh. He created that body through the natural process of childbirth to create a body so he could come be with us. And so a lot of people overlook this. But in Isaiah, when it's prophesying the birth of Jesus, it's uh, very interesting what it says. And this scripture, if you've been around Christianity at, at all, um, this scripture is going to be very uh, familiar to you. Uh, we hear it a lot at Christmas time because it is an Old Testament prophecy that uh, Jesus would be born, that the Messiah was coming. And so Isaiah 9 and 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Sound familiar? Um, we we hear this all the time at Christmas, you know, when when we're talking about the baby being born in a manger and uh, the wise men coming and the shepherds coming and the star over Bethlehem and, uh, you know, being in the manger and, and uh, having to be in the, the barn because there was no room in the inn and all of these stories. We hear this scripture because it is prophesying that happening. And it says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. This is talking about Jesus. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. And then there's this little piece that we often just read right over and never understand that it's talking about Jesus. And it says, his name shall be called the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So if Jesus and Father um, are one, what about the Holy Spirit? Well, let's go back to John chapter 14 because Jesus is revealing a lot here in John chapter 14 of who he is. And you see that he's, he's telling them a lot of things and, and they're not getting it yet. They don't understand it yet. Um, but he's saying that, you know, he's not going to leave them comfortless, that he is going to send another comforter. This is right after they've had the discussion you know, Jesus, show us the Father. How can you not know that I am not the Father? How can you have been with me so long that you don't? This is right after that discussion. Jesus is saying that he's going to send another comforter for them. Well, uh, a lot of people take this another word and they use it to explain that he's talking about the, the other person in the Godhead. The comforter would be the Holy Spirit. And uh, we know that the comforter is, a, is the Holy Spirit. He's the one that lives inside of us. He is the one that uh, we take with us everywhere they go. And Jesus was saying, I will send you another comforter. But let's stop and examine this for a second, because um, at this point, they had a comforter. If he's going to send them another one, then we need to know what the comforter was um, at the time of this discussion. What, comfort, what comforter did they have with them? And the answer to that is Jesus. He was their comforter. He was their enabler. And if you look at uh, how they were when they had the comforter with them, you can see this very plainly. 
um, when Jesus was there, Peter, for one, was very, very brave. You know, he took out his sword and he was about to face several Roman soldiers and he even took a swipe at one and cut his ear off before Jesus stopped him. He was, he was brave. He was ready to die for Jesus. Let Jesus be taken away. And suddenly all of them are hiding, fearing for their lives, denying that they even knew him. And so when you take that comfort away of Jesus being there, suddenly they were cowards. They denied that they even knew him, especially that they even followed him. And uh, they were like that until he rose from the dead and, and came back to visit them. And then suddenly they were brave again. They, were, uh, they weren't hiding. You know, they were ready to follow him. And there was 500 with him on the hillside when he ascended into heaven. So he got quite a following once he came back from the grave. Um, and he was telling them that I'm, I'm going in John chapter 14, when he's telling them, you know, you see me, you've seen the father, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Um, he's, he's saying all of this here in that chapter, John chapter 14. And he's telling them that I'm leaving. Well, of course they don't want him to leave. They didn't want, he, he was there again. He was alive again. Um, the disciples did not want him to leave. So why did Jesus why didn't Jesus stick around? I'll tell you why. If Jesus had stuck on earth in bodily form, every Christian in the world would be wherever he's at right now. If Jesus was in Bethlehem right now, sitting back on a recliner, uh, every Christian in the world would be around that building. We would not go anywhere else. If we knew Jesus was somewhere on this earth, we would go there. And Jesus wanted us to send, to spread out and preach the gospel. You know, at that point, there was, you know, only 120 on the day of Pentecost. Jesus didn't want those 120 people sitting around him all day long. He wanted them to take the gospel to the whole world. And so he was telling them, I want you to go to all nations and I want you to teach them. I want you to baptize them. And uh, he's saying, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send a comforter to you. And the, the genius behind this is that, Now we don't have to all go to where this body is to have our comfort, but we take him with us. He is on the inside. And so Jesus is with me in Seattle. He's with somebody else in Africa. He's with somebody else in Australia. All at the same time, we don't have to all migrate to where this God is. He is with us everywhere. That's the beauty of the second comforter. But this second comforter is not another person in the Godhead because two scriptures After Jesus said that I'm going to send another comforter to you, two scriptures after that, he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Jesus is is in this one chapter, in this one scene where he is talking with his disciples, he is describing, I am the father and I am the comforter that is going to come to you later. I want you to go to Jerusalem. I want you to wait there until you're in due with power from on high, which is the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in chapter two. And he was basically saying, I'm the father and I'm going to be this another comforter. And so we have all of this here. So I believe when you read the Bible, it it clearly shows us that Jesus is the father um, and Jesus is the Holy Ghost, that all of these three make up from one God. It's not three making up one God. It's one God making up those three. It's not three different persons. It's one God revealing himself in three different ways. He revealed himself as Jehovah in the Old Testament. He revealed himself as Jesus in uh, in the man Jesus, our mediator, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And he revealed himself as the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter two and throughout uh, the rest of history. And so I believe that there's only one God. I believe that scripture teaches us that there's only one God, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are all one. In Revelations chapter 4, John the Revelator uh, shows us a scene of heaven where he is caught away, and uh, he was in the Spirit, and behold, he was caught into heaven. Uh, Revelation 4, verses 2, he says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one set on the throne. He didn't see three thrones. And he didn't see three people on one throne. He said, I saw a throne set in heaven, a throne, and one set on the throne. Ephesians 4, 5 through 6 says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. So the Father of all is in you all. What is in you is the Holy Spirit. 
The Father is in you all. The Father is the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Um, and so they're all the same one. Peter, James, John, Paul, Barnabas, Timothy, all of these people preached and believed in one God, that Jesus was God manifest in flesh. Paul is the one that said that in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Paul is the one that said, great is the mystery of godliness. He was manifest in the flesh. Um, and so when we read these scriptures, when we, when we study, we realize that there is no Holy Trinity in the Bible. There is no Holy Trinity. However, if you read Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 15, you don't find the Holy Trinity, but you do find this. I am the Lord, your Holy One. And uh, one is capitalized. He is the Holy One of Israel. And so that's why I believe that there is one God. I invite you to study that out, study these scriptures that we've mentioned. And if you have any questions or concerns about how many gods there are, you can send us your questions, your comments to ask at refugeseattle.com. Uh, you can visit us every Sunday in downtown Seattle, Belltown 5th and Bell in Seattle at 1 o'clock in the Belltown Community Center. That's where we're having services at this point. You can subscribe to us on YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud, Facebook, Twitter, and of course you can always find us at RefugeSeattle.com. Thank you for tuning in to the Refuge Church of Seattle podcast. We hope that it was valuable for you in this lesson, and uh, we invite you to subscribe and come back again and again, and, uh, and also to uh, submit your questions. Thanks for tuning in. We will see you next time.